Welcome to Authors Revealed. I'm Becky Anderson. We are so excited. We have New York Times best-selling author of The Weird Sisters. It's Eleanor Brown, and her new novel is called The Light of Paris. Well, Eleanor, welcome to Naperville and Anderson. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. No, it's great to finally have you here. Thank you. And we're so excited. Your second novel is out, mm -hmm. The Light of Paris. So I want to know, what what was it like, you know, to get the second book? Because the Weird Sisters came out five years ago, mm -hmm. and and to have this book now out in the world. What does it feel like? Does it feel really good? It does feel really good. It feels like a huge <laughs> like a huge relief. So you know, right. the Weird Sisters um, was a huge success, yes, which it was. is a wonderful thing and a total blessing. Um, but you know, success also has has you know some difficulties to it. Sure. And with a book, it's something like the question, "What's next?" Yeah. And that was a real struggle for me to come yeah. up with not just the next book, but the right book. So to then have written, found the right book, found the right story, and have it out in the world, it's a relief, it's exciting, I'm hearing yeah. from readers, they're connecting, so it's great. Yeah, so it's only, it'll be out a week, a week tomorrow, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. a week tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So what are you hearing from those fans of the Weird Sisters? I mean, because this is a very different story. I mean, in, in some ways it has similarities. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that mother-daughter, that type mm -hmm. of, you know, identity type of thing, but mm -hmm. it, it is a di much different story. So what are they, what are you hearing from them? So I'm so interested when people say it's a different story because I, I mean, I think of it as a very similar story. So it's a family story in the it's same way. Right. You know, we exactly. sisters, exactly. with sisters, obviously. Uh, this is mothers and daughters. Um, uh, I think that, you know, as a writer, writers are interested kind of in the same things. So I'm always, sure. we're always writing yeah. about the same things. Whatever my hearing from readers, I had somebody come up the other day at a reading and give me the biggest compliment. Um, she said, you know, I was reading just the first chapter and there's this part in it that there that I thought I was the only one who felt that way. And oh. to see it on the page was, you know, just wonderful. And that, to me, is the power of story, right? I'm no not kidding. alone. I'm no, not no, the no, only exactly. one. No, 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 exactly. But you've connected with that reader on a level that, you know, just to hear that one, you, yeah. I've done it. I'm okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay that it. felt so good. Yeah, that is so cool. So, um, The Weird Sister was a New York Times bestseller mm -hmm. and a huge reader favorite in our mm -hmm. store and with book groups mm -hmm. and everything. Um, so, so talking about sitting down to write that second novel, and I know know the the germs that got this one, mm -hmm. the seeds that start the, the story are, are very different. And I think that's why the stories are different because we're going between two time periods. Oh right. And the way the story goes back and forth, mm -hmm. a lot of the the themes of the book are similar. Mm -hmm. But um, so tell us, where do those seeds start to grow, and and the idea for the story because it's such a great story in it itself. It is a great story. Yeah, right. So um, and and it's really kind of one of these moments where the universe just handed me a gift. So yeah. I was really struggling to find the right story, and uh, my I was talking to my parents about Jazz Age Paris. I don't know why this came up, but it did. And my father just casually says to me, you know, your grandmother lived in Paris in the 1920s, and. I was like, no, I didn't know that actually. Yeah. Um, and then my mother chimes in and she says, yes, and we have all of the letters that she wrote home to her family oh, while she was there. Wow. So, you know, as a human being, that's an amazing story, right? As a family member, that's an amazing story. But as a writer, you know, I nearly fell yeah, over. Yeah, sure, <laughs> so, sure. um, so that started, and I, and I went home and I, I read her letters and just kind of had so many questions that, that mm -hmm. came to mind as I read them. So I started to create a story around, sort of inspired by my grandmother's trip to Paris or time in Paris in the 1920s. Yeah. And then I, I created a granddaughter character um, to sort of answer some of the questions sure. that I feel like like were raised for me by reading those right, letters. Right. Yeah. So, so why do you think your parents didn't they didn't they didn't think it was important to mention this cool fact that she know. was she was you know in the twenties in Paris? You know, they, I don't yeah. know. I mean, I guess yeah. that's not the kind of thing that comes up in casual conversation. Right, um, right. I didn't know my grandmother, uh, and so this was another really wonderful sure, thing about this sure. experience is that I didn't know my grandmother really at all, um, and um, you know, the way that my mother talked about her was very different from mm -hmm. the person I saw in these letters, uh, and that was to me as a writer what was so exciting was kind of like how right. do we become the people we right. become and what happens to change us and how does that reverberate through generations yeah. so uh so yeah so all of those questions come no because i think that repeated itself in the book about you know you think of who you are when you're young and your dreams mm -hmm. and your energy and who you are mm -hmm. as a person mm -hmm. but then as you age I think the members of your family see you, even though inside mm -hmm. that still exists. But you know, you think of your your grandparents, or mm -hmm. even your mother, mm -hmm. or whoever, mm -hmm. and we change. 
but yet we don't change. Mm -hmm. But our family members see us differently than mm -hmm. we may see ourselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes so they don't let us change, right? That's so that was something right. I read about in the Weird Sisters sure. was, you know, yeah. how when you're with your family, you are who you were when you were seven, right? right. You know, no matter what. Right. So your grandmother's name was uh, Catherine, is it Remini? Uh, Ramin. 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 Uh, McReynolds, mm -hmm. and yes. you and you dedicated the book to both of your grandmothers I did. because what I thought was interesting is your other grandmother, Madeline, mm -hmm. is the name of the of the granddaughter yes. in the story, yes. which I thought was so wonderful. Yes. But then also to the wonderful quote you put from your grandmother, it says, "Paris in the rain is still Paris," mm -hmm. which was this great yeah. thing. She just starts one of her letters to her parents that way. Yeah. She says, "Paris in the rain is still Paris," and you know the book is somewhat about kind of blooming where you planted and somewhat right. about finding your 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 place and also just kind of seeing things clearly and so I just thought that was such a great epigraph and yeah. I'm so grateful to her for writing that in yeah, one of her no, letters. It was, it was, it was beautiful and I love their dedication in this. Um, so we have a story in mm -hmm. 1999 mm -hmm. and then going back to 1924. Mm -hmm. It starts actually a little earlier and um, um, so how was that writing from one part to the next part? Was it really fun? Like you couldn't wait to write one of the stories, whether it was Madeline, the granddaughter, or it was the grandmother of Margie? Um, well, I actually wrote them uh, separately. So, like, I oh, wrote Margie's okay. story in 1924. And then I wrote Madeline's story in 1999. I think going back and forth would have been really tricky. Now, ultimately, I had to then do a lot of work to align, because it does alternate chapter sure. by chapter. Right. Um, so I had to do a lot of work there. But you know, one of the reasons I was very hesitant about writing a story with parallel narratives, because I feel like when I read a book that has parallel narratives, there's mm -hmm. a tendency to fall in love with one storyline more than the other, right? Sure. And I sure. really didn't want that to happen. So um, fortunately for me, I fell in love equally, you know, with Margie and Madeline. And so I really tried to make it so the reader would fall in love with both of them yeah. too. And that was, that was really, really easy. So let's, let's talk about Madeline, you mm -hmm. know, and I think she's living in Chicago, the Chicago, yeah, yeah which is yeah. so interesting. So we have our Chicago connection uh -huh. and she's married to Phil, who is not such a nice guy. Not so much. Not a nice guy, Mr. Perfect, um, who kind of only sees her as a trophy. She needs to look a certain way, behave a certain thing, a certain way and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, so, you know, she is sort of trapped mm -hmm. in a relationship that really is not letting her be who she is mm -hmm. and, and to find her own identity. So I was just wondering, is she, a, is, is Madeline or even Margie, mm -hmm. their DNA, mm -hmm. where does it come from? And is it a composite of some of your family members or did you, did you base them how much is, is Madeline a little bit of you? Oh. <laughs> or, so, or even Margie. I right. mean, obviously, she, you did get some of that DNA from your own grandmother sure. because of the storyline. So um, Margie, I think, is maybe a little bit like my grandmother. Margie is very sweet and very naive and very easily excitable. And that's kind of like me. I describe myself as aggressively cheerful. <laughs> and I think Margie's a little bit the same way. Um, and uh, so Madeline, though, was created really kind of in response to Margie. Oh. So, um, you know, it was kind of these questions that Margie raised, who's the person who's going to help me answer those questions? Right. So I think that maybe some of the some of the questions that Madeline is struggling with are questions that I struggle with that I think a lot of people do. You know, what's my role? Kind of who am I? Do I have to keep going on this path that I'm on? Or do I, do I have the right to change my life right. um, and make myself happy just because I'm unhappy? So those are all things that I've wrestled with. Right. Um, I think she's a little, she's definitely got my sense of humor, but she may be a little more sarcastic than than I am, yeah. right? There's that aggressively yeah. cheerful part again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think yeah. that, you know, I always describe my stories as emotionally true, but not factually right. true. So yeah. um, I think that the questions that they're wrestling with are very much my question. Right. And, and you know, the story of multiple generations, but also that mother-daughter relationship, can, mm -hmm. which can be contentious mm -hmm. at times for many, for many women. Mm -hmm. And it is, you know, it's so interesting, this book, and the way we look at our grandmothers is so different than the way we look at our mothers mm -hmm. and their relationship. Right, right. And I, I find that, and that was true in this book, but it's also true for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's, it's true for grandmothers looking at their daughters compared to their granddaughters. Right, right. You know, well, it's so that weight of expectations <laughs> yeah. that gets yeah, removed yes. in the grandparent-grandchild relation. And that's kind of a relief for everybody, yeah. I think, right? <laughs> no you just kidding. get to enjoy each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I know you did some research, and you did some 
some really cool research and the way you got over to Paris. So just the way Margie would have done back mm -hmm. in 1924. Tell us about your trip across with a transatlantic sea trip. Right. So I, I wanted to go to Paris to kind of research this novel. Um, I know it's a very difficult job, but someone has to do it. Um, <laughs> but I was determined to really try to follow my grandmother's journey as literally as possible. So we took a ship from New York to Southampton in England. Um, and uh, it was a lot, I mean, it was a lovely experience. We went on, you know, Cunard, which is a fabulous, elegant cruise line. But I have to say, like I don't know if you know this but there are planes that will do this in 10 hours <laughs> instead of in seven days um, and it and it was kind of it was kind of exhausting in that way but it but it made me think of how they tr thought of time so differently sure, right sure. Um, and I use that in the novel you know I talk about that 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 the the speed or lack of speed in in 1924 yeah. kind of allows Margie to live the life that she right. does and even communicating um, with family back home it does, it takes it a takes while. a while yeah, yeah a right. week was the absolute fastest if everything went right a week right. was the fastest you could hear back from each other sure. um, but anyway so so I really I you know made a list of all the places Places that she had gone in Paris and I went to all of those places mm -hmm. and um, tried to kind of see Paris through her eyes. Yeah. And what was your favorite place that your, that your grandmother had visited? I would say, well, my favorite place was the Luxembourg Gardens, mm. and specifically the Medici Fountain in the Luxembourg Gardens. Just this very lovely shaded place where you can just kind of sit and enjoy and watch people go by. Oh, yeah. um, she, you know, the sad thing is, is that you can go to Paris, but you can't go to Paris in the 1920s, right? right so, right. you know, a lot of the places that she visits are really changed now. There's mm -hmm. this wonderful restaurant that she talks about that makes an appearance in The Light of Paris um, that uh, is now, like, it's basically a 7-Eleven now. Oh, <laughs> I know, oh, and I was kind of standing oh. on the corner looking at it sadly, yeah. you know, wishing, wishing sure. that, it, that I could go back to 1924. Yeah. But um, working in the American Library, that's, mm -hmm. that's still there, mm -hmm. right? It is, is it has moved. It's, moved. it's in a different location. Oh, different location. Now, yeah. okay. It's much larger now, and so uh -huh. it's sort of a, what I would call a real library. Okay. Um, the American Library in Paris was basically, they had this huge question after the war, they'd shipped a number of books over for the soldiers and then they had this question of what to do with mm -hmm. them so they basically created a library to warehouse these books mm -hmm. uh, and then it just grew from yeah. from there and that was where my grandmother worked yeah. so any other research you did you know looking into the 20s and, and mm -hmm. what would paris was like anything that you found really surprising or super interesting about that time period so you know i think the thing that surprised me most was especially when we read historical fiction, you know, we have these expectations. We think people spoke a certain way and behaved a certain way, but you know, they were still people. And I look at my grandmother's letters that she wrote and she was, you know, 23 when she went over to Paris. And aside from the slang, I could have written those letters. You know, yeah, she's yeah. concerned with the same things and she's got this kind of swagger to her. Mm -hmm. You know, she's 23, so she knows absolutely everything and she has opinions on everything. And really, you know, I think we think of that as people as so different, but they yeah, weren't. Right. People are just people. Uh, yeah. And that was kind of the most fun discovery for me of doing some historical yeah. research. And it was so, I mean, these two stories of these two women, a grandmother and a granddaughter, mm -hmm. who really didn't know each other. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so interesting but their mindsets and what they're what they're what they're shooting for what they're aiming for mm -hmm. what they're trying to accomplish for mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. and their inner beings but 75 years apart right. I thought that was so cool right yeah. right yeah. yeah and they really are very concerned with the with the same thing there I mean and sometimes that's practical right there mm -hmm. she's a uh, Margie's interested in writing and Madeline's interested in painting mm -hmm. so there's this question about art and creativity right. and um, having permission to do that and giving yourself permission to do that especially if other people around you don't approve of your creativity right. um, but also just this kind of quest for independence Independence and happiness and freedom from other people's expectations. Sure. Those are timeless questions. Oh, right, right. And overbearing moms. They both had overbearing <laughs> moms do. and critical they mothers, do. and uh, ones who are trying to put you into a mold and tell you know tell you what you what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, but um, this book, you know, they talk about the search for self mm -hmm. and 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 to control our own destinies. And and what's so we don't want to give away too many spoilers here. <laughs> I get it. I get it. But but well. 
Well, it cha it's a little different. Different what happens for for Madeline than right. what happens for Margie, right? Right. Because I think the expectations in that time when she goes back home, mm -hmm. and we don't want to give too much away. Mm -hmm. you know, I think I'll have I to, I'll have to be quiet now. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> to be quiet. With the weird yeah. sisters, you know, people would say, "Oh, I haven't finished reading the book," and I would say, yeah. "Well, okay, right. I won't give away the car chase at the end." But this one does have some some turns at the end. Their lives do end up differently, but yeah. I think that part of the lesson of it is is learning from the past, right? Sure. Sure. Um, whether it's your own past or it's you know stories you have access to yeah. learning and and making different decisions because of that yeah you know margie had come from a, a wealthy um, washington dc family mm -hmm. and with certain societal you know expectations and demands tell, tell us a little about that age and did i read that you grew up in dc or I, I grew up just outside washington, washington, DC. so yeah. what, what were those expectations that society had in the 20s for for a you know a family higher in society and wealth so she came from an interesting family, my, my grandmother, and I, I didn't use all of that for Margie, but yeah. um, my great-grandfather was a very successful businessman. And he really, you can tell, so we only have my grandmother's letters from mm -hmm. Paris, we don't have her parents' letters, but you can kind of tell the other half of the conversation, mm -hmm. which is basically like, you need to get your act together, young lady. Um, and he really, you know, was fine for her to get married, but if she wasn't gonna get married, then she needed to have a job, or she needed right. to get a start in a career. And there was this real expectation that she needed to make something of herself. And there's this very touching um, uh, line in one of the letters my grandmother writes home where she says, I've made up my mind that when I come home, I'm either going to take a typing course or get married. You know, both of which are yeah. completely understandable and, you know, wonderful sure. paths to yeah. take, but can you imagine those being the only two? Yeah. Right. Um, so when it, with Margie, I constrained her even more. And so right. in her family, marriage is the only option, right? It's the expectation yeah. of someone of her stature that she's going to get married. And um, she's uncomfortable with that idea for, for all kinds of reasons, um, right. mostly because she doesn't think she's worth while yeah. which is also something madeline wrestles with later yeah. on and it's so you know it's so it's so interesting that margie that this she has so much energy and so mm -hmm. but yet this this inner this opinion of herself mm -hmm. and what she she thinks she's capable of mm -hmm. they sort of are in in opposition to one another right. you know right. yeah right so she has sent uh, Margie in mm -hmm. the book yeah, uh -huh. is sent over as a chaperone for, uh -huh. for our cousins that she can't stand. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was so interesting that this is sort of a penance for her to refusing uh, another um, gentleman who, yeah, right, wanted to, and she refused him. Yeah, right, right, yeah. She turns yeah. down this marriage yeah. proposal, right. um, and uh, and so she's sent off to Europe to be a chaperone, and she's not quite sure whether this is a punishment or not, right? Because it right. sounds right. sounds like kind of fun, but uh, her charge is is kind of uh, is kind of awful. Yeah, and Phil, he he was nasty. Philip, yeah, Matt Madeline. Especially Madeline's. at the end, and I won't say, but he's just he's just nasty. So I want to know who did you base him on? <laughs> Well, you know, he is yeah. really, it's funny because this is tricky. This is a, Madeline's parts are written in first person. Mm -hmm. So we only ever see her point of view, right. right? So the question is, is he really that terrible? Or is it just that she sees him that way? Right. But you know, Philip is, this book is a lot about expectations. And Philip is somebody who is so conscious of other people's expectations. And really he takes that out on Madeline, right? Because right. he's so sure. nervous that she's going to be perceived as lacking somehow and therefore he's going to be perceived as lacking right. somehow right. so but yeah he's not a, he's not fun to be around no, he's not, <laughs> yeah. so you have you have the anti phil or philip that mm -hmm. comes later in the story his mm -hmm. name is henry mm -hmm. and he's a chef mm -hmm. so that was so refreshing you know and yeah. Yes. Yeah, so. Well, I can tell you, Henry. Henry is based on someone. Henry oh, is, okay. is, is, okay. is based on my my current partner. He's, oh. the, he's the good the good okay. boyfriend. Um, right. But you know, and she's she really like Madeline is very concerned about her sure. appearance, and her mother's really hard on her about her weight, and and so you know, Henry is the chef who literally feeds her. Yeah. You know, which is right. kind of this lovely metaphor. Food sure. is such a lovely metaphor for caretaking, um, and yeah. really just is there to help her kind of open to the possibility that right. her life could be different. Yeah. Yeah, I love that part of the story. You know, it's it's so it's so interesting. This book is is so true about how so it's so easy to fall into relationships that are unnurturing. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. whether it starts with a parent, but then you kind of just roll into the next one. Mm -hmm. You know, as an adult, mm -hmm. and it's it's you know whether it's an overbearing mother or it's an overbearing you know partner or right, spouse right. or something. But it's so easy for those who have experienced it and not been able to express themselves with who they are mm -hmm. to just 
roll into another mm -hmm. relationship mm -hmm. like that. Well, and you get a script in your head, right? We yeah, all have these right, scripts that roll sure. inside our head, and and both of both Margie and Madeline, they get the script from their mother. You know, that's mm -hmm. like you're not good enough. Um, and so then when they walk into a romantic relationship, it's you know, well, I'm not good enough, so this is the, the best I'm gonna have. Right. And then and when Margie, after she she goes home mm -hmm. after uh, uh, the the a breakup or separation with Phil, she mm -hmm. goes home to see mm -hmm. her mother, mm -hmm. and it's so interesting the interplay between. Uh, Madeline, I mean, not mm -hmm. Margie, Madeline yeah. and her mother. But, um, and then uh, another giveaway, I don't want to give away the <laughs> ending. Because, but her mother is a is an incredible gardener and mm -hmm. just showing mm -hmm. her artistic. Right, stuff. exactly. And that there's more similarities between a mother and daughter who just, right. you know, you know, hit heads when it comes to their relationship with each other. Right. But I thought there was some, some interesting, you know, aspects of these two women yeah, yeah and they get yeah. to discover those things about right. each other right? right it's like they've yeah. never yeah. communicated honestly with yeah. each other they've never stopped they've been so busy as you say kind of butting heads that right. they never take the moment to say well wait a minute you know i'm a painter and my mother's a gardener and look at look at the color in her garden right isn't this her painting right. Right. in a way so it's this really kind of lovely recognition of each other as people right and I think it must have been, well, it was very hard for Madeline to go home, mm -hmm. knowing that that's what's await her, but it was... Well, she's, she's kind of yeah. like, oh, I just got to get out of here, I yeah. got to get out of here, and then she goes home, and it's like, what was I thinking? This is not a better <laughs> idea. <laughs> right, right, right. So, Eleanor, what, what do you remember as your earliest recollection that you wanted to be a writer? And do you remember that first thing that you wrote? I, I think sixth grade okay. was really kind of when I when I came into it. I had a teacher who read my writing and really kind of took me on and was like, you have something here. Yeah. Um, and that was really what sparked my interest. And I remember everything I wrote that year. You know, I remember yeah. the first, the description I wrote of like a clearing in a forest and a tiger. And I remember a story about two best friends. And I remember, you know, the, the quote novel that I wrote that was about 30 pages long about the daughter of a movie yeah. star. I mean, I remember everything right. from that. And that was really the beginning of my love affair with yeah. writing. Is it it's incredible what one teacher can do to it spark does, that love and, and to get. So you had taught school for I a did, number of years. I did. So you must have done the same for your students to pass them. I on. hope so. Yeah. I really hope yeah. so. It's tricky because um, you know I taught middle school, and so all the focus is on high school, right? Those are, you know, those are the, when kids graduate. Like those are the teachers that that they call out. But I feel like middle school is such a formative time for kids, yeah. and I do reconnect with my former students every yeah. once in a while. A bunch of them follow me on social media and I love seeing their little faces <laughs> pop up you know oh, how are you doing? Um, uh, so I hope that, that I reached out to them in some way I certainly tried to be loving and encouraging because there is nothing you need when you are 13 like someone to be loving and encouraging to you right. yeah so I noticed that you you Skype or you call in for book groups. I do. It's so, so fun. So I know. So tell us a little bit about that because you're one of those rare authors that will do that. And and I know there's there's some that will do that, but I think that is so wonderful. It so, is so, so fun. So what what do you get out of those experiences when you Skype in? It's so interesting because every conversation is different. And certainly there are questions that I get, you know, similar questions that I get repeatedly, but I really feel like every call that I have with a book group, at least there will be one question that I have never heard before oh, wow. um, and it's just so exciting and then I always ask because with the weird sisters um, was very much about birth order so I would ask people to tell me their birth order and we'd talk about families and different families and you know the way that the way that they grew up yeah, right. and very often they would learn things about each other we're, we're talking about book groups that have maybe been re meeting for 10 15 20 years mm -hmm. and they would learn things about each other that they never knew before oh, so that's so interesting. yeah and that was just wonderful to be yeah. the vehicle for that so I'm really excited with the light of Paris to be able to talk about you know kind of mother and daughter relationships and creativity and all of those things and hopefully get people to, to learn yeah. things about each other and, again. And family stories. Family and, and stories, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But also too, I, you're one of three girls I in am. your family. So, I am. So you must have learned something about your family by writing the Weird Sisters yourself too. I did. You know, I think, I think that it was a lot of things that I kind of recognized, but I didn't mm -hmm. know the reasoning behind. Um, and it really forced me to think about them when I was putting, when I was putting them on the page. Sure. So uh, my question about outlining, and I ask every author this question, are you an outliner or is it something just very 
basic and as you write you're you're surprising yourself and the story takes you as it does us as the reader well if you had asked me this question when i wrote the weird sisters my answer would have been very different with the ah. weird sisters i did not outline at all okay. um, i just kind of clanged around in the story until i found my way okay. um, and that was very painful and i wasted a lot of time and wrote a lot of words <laughs> i didn't need to um, so with the light of paris in the intervening years i had taught myself to outline oh, okay. and to outline just enough so that i knew mm -hmm. where i was going i envision it sort of like if you're going to take a road trip you know you don't know where every single stop you're going to have to make but it's really helpful to know that say you're going to drive to san francisco right so yeah. that's the way i think about it i've got yeah. some general ideas about what i want to have sure, happen sure. yeah well this book i'm, I'm sure we had to like you said you wrote each story separately and right. then then piece them together which right. is i find amazing so you teach some writing workshops mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so what, what would you say for someone who wants to be a writer, wants to write that story, mm -hmm. what would be your you know, maybe top two or three you know, pieces of advice for someone who really wants to sit down and write, either, either non-picture or, or, or fiction? Or fiction. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't matter because yeah. you know, good writing is good right. writing, good story yeah. is good story. So the thing I hear most often is I don't have time. And so um, my response to that is I have not yet met someone who actually does not have time. What people have is an overabundance of fear. Yeah. Um, and so I encourage them to come up with some kind of mantra that they can say to themselves uh -huh. when they're writing, oh, you know, good. something like I can fix it later or, you know, done is better than perfect or something just so they can get them, get the words on the page. Right. Um, I would really encourage them to read Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert, oh, which is yeah. a fantastic oh. book for creatives of yeah, any kind. Sure, sure. Um, and I would encourage them to start really, really small. It's just like New Year's resolutions. People say, well, I'm going to you know, start writing for four hours every day. Well, it's just like saying you're going to go to the gym for four hours every day. It's just not going to happen. But if you could start writing for 10 minutes, three days a week, and then build from there, you would be shocked by yeah. how much you, you can get done. Yeah. OK. OK. And what are you working on now? I mean, what do we, what do we hope to see after? Like I, I said well, before we sat down, I would love to see you right away. But, <laughs> well, but, but what, are, what are you working on or now, or is it more now that this book is just uh -huh. just out in the world? Oh, no, um, I got some cooking. Okay, um, so can so you then, tell us a little bit? <laughs> sure. So, well, okay. I can tell you about one of them. The next okay. thing you're going to see from me um, is actually an anthology that I edited, uh, which consists of best-selling female authors who've written books about Paris. And it's their oh, personal experiences with Paris. Nice. So Paula McLean, who wrote The Paris Wife, oh, is in yeah. there. And J. Courtney Sullivan, who wrote The Engagements. And Therese Fowler, who wrote Z, the, Z, a novel of Zelda Fitzgerald. And I'm in there. And we're all talking about sort of the story behind the story, right? Yeah. Like, what was Paris like for us? So you'll see that next year. Um, and then I am working on another novel. But I feel, I feel like the baseball player who won't change his socks all during the playoffs. <laughs> but I have learned that if I start talking about what I'm working on, okay, the magic don't, goes don't. out. And don't. So I will just tell you that I am That's working right. on another novel, cool. and I'm super excited to share. But it with I people. love the the stories. The, so it's nonfiction short stories about it's, their experiences. Yeah, of, it's memoirs of of, of yeah. you know, these best selling writers who've written books about Paris, Paris but have been there exactly. and had to do their own research and, and experience great. it for themselves. They are great. You know, with Kara Black, who's a mystery yeah, writer, is in there. Right. Everybody's everybody's experience is so oh, wildly that sounds, different. Oh, sounds great. Okay, we look forward to that. Okay, I end all these interviews with a, a literary quiz. So this okay. you are the author on your own reading so okay you know all the answers so okay. it's kind of a lightning round so whatever comes to you first okay, okay. favorite book when you were a child uh, the outsiders by se hinton uh, okay do you remember something that you read in high school that has still stayed with you um isabella allende's the house of, house of the spirits how about something when you were in college or working on your masters that has still remained with you I read a lot of classics for the first mm -hmm. time in college. Um, I broke my leg in college, and I remember reading Gone with the Wind in the college library. Oh. Not for class, just for <laughs> fun. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, how about a book, any book you've read in your entire life that you've been an evangelist for that not enough people could read it that you could get there? Oh, my gosh, there are so many of those. Um, so the one that, that pops right into my head right now is... Um, a recent book by an author called Laura McBride uh, called uh, We Are Called to Rise right. uh, yes. came out last year or two right. years ago or something yeah, and it was ju it is just absolutely gorgeous and I just want to like thrust it into people's hands. It's so great. Okay. How about the last book you gave as a gift? Last book I gave as a gift. Um, 
I gave mine to a bunch of people. <laughs> well, that's good. I, I hope that would be your answer. Um, it was. It was probably big magic. It was probably oh, okay. Magic. Okay. And what about what are you reading now? Or you've read recently that you actually? So um, I'm reading a couple of things right now. Um, I'm rereading the Thorn Birds. Oh yeah. Which is so interesting don't to think read about it. the movie they made. For oh, I haven't seen. I haven't seen it. Don't see it. Don't okay. see it. Okay. Um, I'm reading that, and I just picked up uh, Delia Efron Syracuse. Yeah. Uh, I'm dragging the hardcover around with me on my book tour. I haven't started to read it yet, but I'm super excited. Okay, 100%. A plus on that quiz. Yay! So, yay, yay woo! <laughs> well, Eleanor, thank you so much for sitting down and talking with me. And congratulations on your second novel, The Light of Paris. Thank you so much for having me. Great conversation with Eleanor Brown about her new novel, The Light of Paris. You will absolutely love this. A beautiful story about a granddaughter and a grandmother finding themselves 75 years apart. Thanks for joining me on Authors Revealed.